Okay, let's get started. Um, actually, this will be our last in-person class this semester. Next Tuesday, we're going to have our online class, and I probably will offer it Monday night or Tuesday night. But like I said, you don't have to um, be there. I will, well, I encourage you to attend, but you don't have to. Uh, then you can watch the video later. Yeah. Uh, then we will have Thanksgiving break. Now, after break, we will have uh, two CTFs. That's it, right? Yeah. Then even after CTF, I think I will push the homework deadline um, after the CTF, the final, uh, because we have to finish at least, I think, 13 homeworks. So there are more challenges you guys need to solve. So having said that, um, so in the syllabus, I said that if 90% of the students submit a course evaluation, everyone will get um, some bonus points. Uh, and uh, we only have one evaluation, so that would be 20, 20 points. Uh, since we only have nine people in the class, which means everyone has to submit, so everyone can get the bonus points. So here, everyone else in the class, they need to submit. Of course, I will also ping everyone. Um, yeah, if we miss one person, you cannot get the bonus points. <laughs> the course feedback. Yeah, the, I think it's called Trace or something. Trace, yeah. Uh, also, I'm offering the same class next semester uh, with some changes. I plan to focus more on 64-bit instead of 32-bit because 32-bit is phasing out. Um, so if you have friends who are into hacking or security, let your friends know. I want to have more students in my class. Um, nine of you are doing very well, but I think I can handle maybe 40. <laughs> Just uh, spread the word for me. Okay. Yeah. So um, today we will talk about uh, cache side channel attack. Uh, then maybe today or next Tuesday, we will talk about Meltdown and Spectral. Uh, which were infamous, discovered, famous or infamous, discovered like five years ago, six years ago, uh, shocked the world. So, uh, first of all, uh, the speed between CPU, the gap between them, between CPU and the DRAM, uh, has been increasing in the last 40 years. So in 1980s, uh, CPU speed and DRAM speed are, are close, okay? So CPU, they have their own storage. For example, like registers, they are also storage. Cache, they are storage. So those are usually made by SRAM. Then DRAM is our main memory in our computer. And DRAM is much slower than SRAM. So DRAM, it's very affordable. DRAM usually is just one resist resistant and uh, a capacitor, a very simple. Uh, but if you use to store one bit, okay? If you use SRAM to store one bit, you probably need uh, six, uh, what is this called? Six, um, I don't remember what they're called. But anyway, the circuit level is much more complicated, right? Um, then in the last many, many years, the CPU speed get much, much faster. The DRAM speed, Will get them also faster, but the gap between them is actually increasing. Um, because of that, we introduce some memory between the CPU and the main memory, the DRAM. Okay, and that memory usually we call it cache. Okay, the CPU cache. It's part of the CPU, and uh, all of this is try to introduce the memory hierarchy here. And we want to put the most frequently used data closer to the CPU or on the CPU, right? For the data you don't use, you don't use, you use it in a decade. Those data you put on tapes, which are very, very affordable, but super slow. Then for other data you are using every day, you put on hard disk, SSD, which is slower than the DRAM, but they are, they are cheaper and also they have other uh, benefits. So for, when it comes to memory, there is always a trade-off between speed, cost, 
capacity, here we're not even touching security yet, right? So there is no perfect memory or perfect storage that is very affordable, super fast, and huge. That doesn't exist, right? It's always a trade-off. Okay. So then what is CPU cache? So cache is a small, relatively small, uh, but a very fast, also expensive memory. Usually they are just SRAM on the CPU die. Uh, so the cache goes between the computation part, the registers of the CPU and the main memory. Uh, it, it keeps a copy of the most frequently used data from the main memory. And the, the even caches, they could be multiple layers, different sizes and their distance to the computing uh, unit, the registers are a little bit uh, different. So this is the data from like long time ago. Uh, the data may not be accurate anymore, but you can get a feeling that the access time for different storages, uh, they are magnitude, to dif the difference is magnitude. For example, cache, SRAM, uh, if you want to move data from cache to the register, it's just nanoseconds, very fast. But if it's DRAM from the dynamic memory, it will be like 100 nanoseconds. Then flashes could be 50,000 nanoseconds, uh, or your hard disk will be much, much slower, right? Then there are two important concepts when it comes to accessing data from the cache, the cache heat and the cache miss. So a cache heat occurs if the cache contains the data, the program, the CPU is looking for. Yeah. That is called a cache heat. Uh, otherwise, it is called a cache miss. And uh, like I said, there are many layers of caches. Uh, the, the one closest to the CPU, we call it as an L1 cache. Uh, usually, L1 cache is divided in code cache and um, a data cache. Not necessarily, different architectures may be different. Uh, also, there are L2, L3 caches, depends, depending on the architecture. Um, and uh, most architectures, we say, uh, L2 and L3 caches can hold data and uh, code, both of them. Okay, so they are unified. They do not separate L2 data cache, L2 code cache. So this is a picture of a very, very old CPU. Uh, this is um, probably uh, 8386, a very old CPU, uh, 30, 40 years ago. But you can see the execution unit only takes a very small area, the bus. Then here we have the data cache. We have the instruction cache, which is a code cache. So those two are the L1 cache and uh, take significant space here. Uh, we have floating, floating point unit and the memory control is also just a small area. Then more than half, 50% of this chip, this is for L2 cache. So if you combine them together, 60% of this die is used for cache, the CPU, right? It's actually a very important part. If you look at this, this is also like a 20 years ago CPU, Intel Pentium 4. Um, so we have two L1 cache here. So this is also a cache. And also the MMU has its own cache for the PRV. Um, here, translation, look at side buffer. If you took a OS class before, you probably heard about this term before. Translation, look at side buffer. So because MMU's job, one of the jobs is to translate a virtual address to a physical address. But to translate that, MMU will refer to the memory tables. Memory tables are big and they are stored on the main memory. There is no CPU storage to store 
uh, the memory tables, okay? They are stored just on the physical DRAM, okay? And because it's on DRAM, it will be a little bit slow. That's why the MMU has its own cache to store um, the recently translated addresses, okay? So in the, inside the CPU, there will be cache to store some information of the bigger uh, memory table. Uh, this is a much newer CPU with eight cores. And uh, you can see this huge part in the middle is a level three cache. And this cache is shared by all eight cores, okay? Then each core, they also have their own L1 and L2 cache in this case. So another important concept when it comes to cache is um, cache line or some books were called cache block. This is the minimum unit of information that can be either present or not present in a cache. Okay. So the smallest unit in the memory is, is what? Usually byte, right? Not necessarily bit, it's, it's more like byte. Yeah. Um, but a cache is more core screen. You cannot say, I just moved this byte from the main memory to the cache. It doesn't work that way. It's too, if it's too fine grained, sometimes, first of all, it will be very expensive. The circuit will be much more complicated. Also, um, it's not necessarily more efficient. Okay. So in modern architectures, uh, Intel and ARM, the cache line or cache block are 64 bytes. When you move some data from memory to cache, or you copy some data from memory to cache, you copy 64 bytes, which contains that data. Maybe your data is only one byte or two, then um, the 64 bytes containing that data will go to the cache. And uh, the cache we're using today, uh, the, the rule we're using today is called the unway set associative cache, uh, which basically means that uh, any given cache line or block in the main memory, okay? So there is a there is a byte in the memory, or there are 64 bytes in the memory. When those data are cached, or when they are being copied to the CPU cache, there are un possible places they can be placed in a cache, okay? In memory, we have a memory address, right? So in cache, we also have an address, but we do not necessarily have a number for those. Okay. Then there are impossible ways to put the, the data, and those, are, those, those impossible ways are called one cache set. I will have more, um, animations later to show you how it works. Let's use a 32-bit address as an example here. So this is a 32-bit address. Of course, most of the system we are using now is already 64-bit. And uh, this is the address for the something on the memory, okay? Then the cache we are using in this case is a four-way cache. And the cache itself has 32 kilobytes. Okay. So this one, the memory address space is 32 bit, which means it can be as large as 4 GB, okay? 4 GB memory. But the cache compared to the main memory is very, very small. It's only 32 kilobytes, okay? Very small. And this is a four way. Uh, each cache line is 64 bytes. Four-way means for any data at any address in the main memory, when we copy it to the main cache, there are four places we can copy it to, okay? Four different places, but there are four predetermined places. Um, then that 32-bit address we can divide it then into those three different um, regions, let's say 
the last six bits here is offset from zero to five. So the offset means in that hash line, which particular byte this is, right? So it's six bits. So two to the power of six, that's exactly 64, right? So it can represent 64 bytes. Uh, then we have this bit six to bit 12, which we call it a set number. So those seven bits determines when you go to the cache, which cache line, which set we are using. Um, then the upper bits is called a tag, and uh, they do not determine where the data goes to uh, in the cache. Uh, they have to be stored uh, in the cache. Okay. So here we have four ways, right? So this is this is our cache. Okay? This is our cache. The cache has four ways. We call each column is a way. Uh, each row is a set. Okay. The way is labeled as from zero to three. Um, the set is labeled from zero to one twenty seven. Okay. Then each box here, each cell here, that is a cache line. So when we have a data, let's say we have a we have a data in main memory. When we bring that data from main memory to cache, there are four possible places it can go. It can go to any of those four places in one set, which means in this figure, a set is the row, okay? It can go to any of the of those places. For example, if it go to this set, then it can go to here, or here, or here, or here. Doesn't matter, okay? There is another algorithm to determine which set it goes to, but it can only go to those sets. It cannot go to here, it cannot go to here, okay? And this set is determined, this number, the set number is determined by this address. Okay, this seven bits. So seven bits will be in total 128 sets, right? And uh, we are saving all 64 bytes here. So the address of the offset doesn't really matter. Right? When we store them, we store all 64 bytes. Not only that, whenever we so store data, we don't we need to know where the data is from. That's why we also store this, the, the tag information. So it can go to all those four different places. It cannot go to other places. So what do we really store in one cache line are uh, those information. Could be a little bit more, but those are more important ones. First of all, is the data itself. 64 bytes of data itself, okay? Then there is a dirty bit, which means whether the data in the cache is consistent with the data in the main memory. Okay. When you bring some data from main memory to cache, then you make computations on this data, the data will be first stored in the cache, not necessarily go back to the memory, because going back, to, writing back to the memory takes longer, right? You may not want to want to do that. You want to save time, but if you do something like that, you need to, um, you need to indicate that the data in cache and data in memory uh, is not consistent. They're not the same anymore. Okay, that is what the data be for. Then we have the tag, which is this part, which basically tell us where the data is from. Because we, we are only using this seven bit to decide where to put it, right? Then there, for, there, may, there will be many, many addresses, actually two to the power of like 19 or whatever addresses, they will have the same set number. So you put them on, into cache, you don't really know where they are from. You have to store where they are from. Where are they from are determined by the tag and the set. Set in the cache is determined by where they are stored, 
a tag is not determined anywhere. That's why you need to store that information in the cache, right? Then there is a lot of valid bit to tell whether this cache line is in use right now. Is it valid or not? Question? What? 0 to 127, 127 lines of 64 bytes. No, this is, this is about, this is 128 sets, okay? Each can store, each cell can store 64 bytes of data. Yes. Yeah. That's not a problem. 32 bit CPU means the general register usually is 32 bits, four bytes. But your cache line is larger than. Yes. Yes. The cache line is larger than that. So for the addresses that they map to the same cache set, I already said that from the previous figure, there are so 31 minus 13, that's 18 plus one, so 19, two to the power of 19, those number of addresses, they were mapped to the same set, right? So those addresses, they are called the congruent addresses, okay? Because they map to the same set. Then when we want to replace or put data from main memory to the cache, from the data address, we know which set we should put it, right? We already know that. But we still do not know which way we should put it. There are multiple ways, right? In the previous example, there are four ways. Which set is predetermined? Now, how do we decide which way we put that data? And there are many algorithms, uh, like least recently used. So if those four cache lines are all in use, and we want to bring new data to that cache line, then we need to kick some data in that cache line out, obviously. So which one do we kick out? One of the algorithm is least recently used. So we record which way in this set the cache line has not been used recently. Then we uh, remove that and put new data in. Then we can also do first in, first out, or least frequently used, or we can simply do random. A lot of the embedded systems, we just do random. Uh, I, I think that's easier to implement at the circuit level. Uh, least recently used, this one, obviously, you need uh, at least those, those four ways. Then you need to at least, um, how many bits to store that? Maybe two bits is not enough. You need multiple bits to store that, basically. Right? Why is random easier than first in first out? What? Why is random easier than first in first out? First in first out, you need to. First in first out means you need to maintain the sequence. Which one was first? Which one was first in? Right. Maintain a sequence. That's how many bits you need to maintain that. You need. No, 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 two bits cannot do that. Yeah. More than that, yeah, yeah. Random, you don't need to maintain you for storage. You don't need to store anything, right? No, you only need two addresses to maintain. Your of two, you only have a identity pointer. That's all you need. Why? I mean, let's say you have, you have four. You have four ways here. First in, first out means. If this one is first used, you need to record that. You need to basically you main you need to maintain a list, right? And we're talking about hardware level. You need to maintain a list. Which one is in first? You don't think you mean the pointer. Why? The, the, how about the next one? 
Well, no, first thing first of all, it's not only about the first one. Well, it's still the second one. <laughs> okay, so how can we exploit those characteristics of cache? How can we use this to uh, attack the computer systems we're using? Uh, then almost like 20 years ago, um, people came up with uh, this idea of cache side channel attack. Uh, first of all, it's called a side channel attack. Side channel here means it's not as a major channel. Okay. Why is that? Because modern CPUs, they do not have interface for programmers to probe or access the cache. In this class, we're seeing all kinds of instructions. But did you see any instruction that can directly read the cache? No, right? There are instructions. We can do something to the cache, but it's not like there is an instruction to say, I want to get the set one, way four. I want to get the content of that. There's no instructions to do that. There are instructions to say, we want to flash out this way this set. Some architectures, they have instructions like that. So anyway, so in cache side channel attack, uh, we simply utilize the time differences between a cache heat and a cache miss to infer whether a specific data or code has been recently accessed. Okay, that's it. Yeah. So a cache heat is supposed to be very fast. A cache miss is supposed to be slow. And this is, that's a side channel. And there are many other side channels in our computer system and we can utilize. Uh, then by using that, we can get, we can guess another process in our system or even another virtual machine in the same physical system we are using. What are they doing? Uh, even more than that, uh, what kind of uh, AES keys they are using, something like that. So let's say how it works uh, at a very high level. So here, the instruction I'm using here is actually ARM-based uh, because I have done this on ARM-based systems. So we have a register. The ARM-based systems are registered are not called EAX anymore. It's just R1, R2, R0 to, um, for 64-bit, we actually have X, which is uh, bigger than R, and we have X31, 32. So here we have R1 and R2, two registers. In R1, we have uh, 3,000 in hex. That's a value. R, R0, sorry. R1, we don't care about the value. And this is our main memory. Our main memory, and this is the memory address, uh, 3,000, 3,004 in hex, and those are the data in that memory. So here we have a, a instruction. This LDR is load. The load is similar to move in x86, um, but it works between memory and register. Move in x86, we do register to register, register to memory. That's the same instruction, right? Uh, it's not the same instruction, the same, um, what is that called? Uh, but, but in ARM, they separate. There's move instruction, there's also load instruction. So the bracket here still means this is memory. So this one means we are loading from the memory address specified in R0, load that data from R1, okay. which means in this case, R1, 32 bits. Uh, yeah, this is 32 bit example. R1 is 32 bit. The address is in R0. The data here is actually one. So after this instruction, what we're doing is we're moving this data to register R1, right? That's it. Same as our previous moving. Okay, very simple. So that is usually what we see from the instruction set level. So all our classes so far, when we are talking about the instruction like this, we think about this, right? Very straightforward. But under the hood, it's much more complicated than that. Under the hood, what happens is there is an instruction 
load R1, R0, the CPU will first check, not directly loading from the memory. The CPU will first check if that data, that memory location's data is already in the cache. If it is already in the cache, the CPU will not talk to the DRAM. The CPU will directly bring that data from the cache, which is also part of the CPU, to the register. So it will be much, much faster than that. If it is not in the cache, what the CPU does is it will bring that piece of data to the cache first, then bring, then bring the data to the register. So that data will be stored uh, in the cache. So what do we store here? We have the tag, right? So the, the CPU can look at all the ways and then compare the tag. Yeah. The tag is part of the address, the 32-bit address. Tag tells where the data is from. The CPU is looking for the data from a particular address. And that particular address is divided into two parts, which is tag and set. Yeah. Does it do a linear search all the ways to find the tag and so usually we do not have many ways, or, or like eight ways. Probably I, I think most are like eight ways. Yeah, not many. So even a search could be. I don't know how it works. Yeah, it could be um, faster, not necessarily the circuit level. They can do all kinds of tricks. I say. Yeah. So. If we are an attacker, if we can measure the time before we execute this instruction and after we execute the instruction, then we get uh, T2 minus T1. Then we know how long did this load take, right? And this can be measured at all kinds of layers, not necessarily just at a very low level. Even JavaScript layer, you can measure something like that. You know the JavaScript eventually maps to some instructions, and you can measure that. If you measure that, then what you can infer here is you can infer whether the data at the address 3000 was already in the cache before you try to load it. OK, so that is um, very important information. The, based on this very simple, that's a very, very simple tool we have there, okay? We, we will know, we can know, based on it's fast or slow, we know whether a piece of data, before we try that, to load that, it's already in the cache, okay? Based on that information, that approach, uh, so in the last many years, uh, people came up with all kinds of attack primitives, and they always have very catchy names like this, uh, evict plus time, prime probe, flash flash. It doesn't really mean there are two steps. Sometimes there are more steps. They just want to come up with um, easy to remember names to publish papers. We, we also come up with something called a prime and count, uh, count the numbers uh, several years ago. So we will talk about several of those approaches. Let's say, the very first paper talking about this is called uh, Evict and Time. Okay. So this is uh, like 20 years ago. Um, this approach is very simple. We first measure the execution time of victim program. There is a program we are trying to attack. That's a victim program. We measure the execution time of that. Then we try to evict a specific cache set. How do we evict the data in the specific cache set? How do we do that? There is a cache set. We want to evict the data from the cache set. How do we do that? 
allocated. Exactly. Not not really allocated. We try to bring some new data into the cache to replace the existing ones. So how do we bring new data to the cache? What? We do not randomly access. We random. We access the data at those congruent addresses, right? The congruent addresses data will go to this cache. Right? Then we can evict existing data from the cache. Then we execute the victim program again and measure the time. Then we know at step three here, then we will know if this time that victim program here, when we say program, we probably just mean several instructions, whether those instructions are accessing some particular address, right? And whether accessing some particular address depends on the business logic of the program. And it may depend on some secret, like keys, right? So this is the uh, evict and time, the very approach. The congruent addresses are belong to the main memory. What? Congruent addresses are the main memory addresses to the main Yes, yes. And uh, many different programs on the same machine where share um, some libraries, like libc the victims program and the program attacker runs, they will share libc. Then you're trying to figure out maybe whether libc, some functions, some instructions in libc is accessing some particular address. There could be other libraries as well, obviously. There is another very powerful approach called the prime and the probe. Uh, in this approach, the attacker first occupies a set. So occupies a set here actually has the same meaning as evict the previous ones, right? So the attacker will try to access many addresses of those congruent addresses. So accessing many, many times, maybe thousands of times, try to fill all the ways of one particular cache set. So after that, it will let the victim's programs execute. The victim program execute, it may access some data also in those congruent addresses. Then it will replace some cache lines from that cache set with its own data. Or um, Then in the third step, the attackers will access the previous memory locations again, all those full memories locations again, and measure how long it takes to access those. For this, those two, which are not replaced by the victim program, then um, the attackers will know those data has not been accessed by the attacker. For others, they will not, yeah. So the so the congruent address set, that's a huge address set, right? Like we said before. The congruent so we have we're only talking about 32 bit. 64 bit obviously even complicated. So the offset part doesn't really matter. So this one has 19 bits. This one has seven bits. This one is six bits. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So the congruent addresses, we have two to the power of 19. That many, okay. that's a big number. Uh, how big is this? Several megabytes, actually. So, so several millions. Yeah. So it's millions. Yeah. Uh, the millions address we're not even talking about offset because, yeah, uh, that word we're time on. So this is millions address. 
So we, at the first, when we do prime, the attackers do prime, it will choose several addresses from these millions of addresses that the victim will never use. The, the victim's code will just never use those addresses, okay? Never use, we know that. Uh, then we fill the cache. We fill the cache. Then when the victim runs, it will run some particular addresses. In this case, we may have their battery code. We know which particular addresses they may access. What we are trying to figure out is in the previous execution, whether they really access those. Okay. Does that make sense? In this case, then, then we can try to guess what which addresses they actually accessed. Another approach, flash reload. All those approaches are very similar depending on what the CPU instructions offers. This is very complicated stuff. It depends on how the cache is designed. Um, so this is very complicated stuff. Go back to a uh, computer architecture, right? So you can, depends on the index and tag part. The, 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 it's called like, you can virtually index. So when you index, you use virtual address. And when you store the tag, you store the virtual address. That's called a virtually indexed or virtually tagged. Then you can also do virtually indexed physically tagged. You can also do physically indexed virtually tagged. Yes. And each of those approaches, at least the four approaches there, have their own benefits. I think there's one approach that no one see any benefit. Yeah. But but this is related to that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, this depends on the architecture. Something like that. Um, more likely be something like it also depends on the control flow of the program. Let's say um, this is one branch of the code, branch one. This is a other branch of the code, branch two. Okay. Let's say this is a predicate. And this predicate, depending on the ice beat of your crypto key. So this is a very simple example. It was, it's, in real world, it's more complicated than that. But you can imagine, depending on the ice beat of your crypto key, the crypto algorithm will either execute this branch or execute this branch, right? Then this branch has a memory address. This branch has another memory address. They are, if they are 64 bytes away, they will go to different cache locations. Then use this cache side of the channel attack. You can infer whether this code address was the code here was brought into the cache, or well, this piece of code was brought into the cache. Then you can infer which bit, the value of this bit here, right? This is one example. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. MMAP? You're talking about the system call MMAP? Yeah, when we try to map. No, the MMAP is a virtual, virtual address. Yeah, but like, we, we give the physical address. No, so in MMAP you don't give No, MMAP you give the virtual address. So MMAP, memory map, you can give an address, say, can you load the, what I ask you to load at this address, that's optional parameter. And that address is a virtual address, not a physical address. 
Huh? That's also a virtual address. But the pattern with the address that I put in MLA, let's say I want to toggle some register. That is the physical address of the nope. register that I'm Register doesn't have an address. I'm my my bad. The memory location. Memory is some memory location I want to. No, toggle. that's no, that's virtual address. We're gonna go to any thing here. Okay, so which address you are talking about? Only what? one address here? Yeah. yeah, this address is a virtual address. This is the address you suggest the kernel to map your data to, okay? You don't have to specify this one for this, for this particular system call, okay? So when we are talking about the application level, you do not really say physical address. So, this is the interface for the kernel to provide to the um, user space. You do not say physical address. There are physical address, for example, in the kernel, there's a function called copy, copy to user, um, kernel function, let's say. Yeah, there is a function called copy to user. Uh, I think this one, does this one have a, Copy to user. Uh, even this one, I think, is no. Uh, this one is also virtual address. Um, what is a function to do translation? Walk or something. Next, walk function called walk. Memory memory walk. Page walk function. So you know, you know. Uh, well, the point is, in the kernel, there are some functions, can you can 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 take a virtual address or physical address as the input and also can return physical address. At the user level, everything technically is, is virtual address. Yeah. So in Flash and Renote, the attacker were first flash a memory block, not a set, but just one memory, just the one memory cache, okay? The attacker can do this because the architecture provides an interface to do that, okay? The architecture provides an instruction, something like uh, say flash, and this instruction take a virtual address of the input. And this instruction guarantees that the data at this virtual address will be removed from the cache. It doesn't really matter which line it is, okay? But it will move that. It will not move anything else because the architecture provides an interface like that. So the attacker first flashes a memory block out of the cache, uh, then the victim may access that block again, code or data. When the victim access that again, that piece of data will be, be brought into the cache again, but not necessarily at the original place, right? It, may, it will be the same set, but not necessarily the previous cache ways, maybe here. Now after that, the attackers will try to access that location too. And then it will uh, figure out uh, whether the victim has been has been accessing that location. Okay. So now let's look at our first example. Uh, this is developed by a professor from uh, Syracuse. Let's say we have uh, 
a main function, global variable, junk. Then we have two variables, time one and time two. To make accessing those two variables faster, we do not put those variables in the memory. Instead, we put them into registers. Oh, so we use the C keyword register uh, to suggest the compiler to use register to store those two local variables instead of on stack. Uh, then we have a pointer uh, called address, and we use a volatile keyword to uh, decorate this, register, this, this pointer, uh, which is telling the compiler, don't do some very smart optimizations, okay? Because when the compiler were trying to do all kinds of optimizations, when you try to access the data from a memory location, let's say we have a pointer P points to some memory location. We want to dereference that pointer P pointer. Okay. The first time we dereference that, we want to get the value. The after some time, we want to dereference that again. Okay. The compiler may think those two times we dereference this, nothing has been changed in between. Okay. Then the compiler will say, oh, then I will optimize this time away. At this time, let's say I put the value in register year X. Then I do not touch it. Then the second time the program wants to reference that, I will just give EAX again. Okay. Instead of go back to the memory to get the to fetch the value again. The compiler will do those kind of uh, tricks to make things run faster. And this volatile volatile keyword tells the compiler, don't do this. Okay. The memory this pointer points to, it will change. It's volatile. We don't know when it will change, so you just do not optimize this. The first time you retrieve the data from the memory to the register EX, the second time you also need to do that. You do not just give me what is already in EX. Okay, so that's the purpose. So that's the purpose of the volatile keyword. It will generate different assemblies. Uh, actually, it will generate something we expect. Uh, it's just the compiler doing all kinds of crazy optimizations nowadays, and we don't want those. Then we initialize some arrays here. So you can see we initialize um, the size of here is 10, and each array is actually 4 KB. So we're initializing 40 KB here. And um, then we were put some data there, just start the first to access that. Then we, because we're accessing that, so here we have 4K, we have 10, so each memory page is 4KB, that's 40, 92. Then we have 10 memory pages, 10 memory pages. Then, Are they congruent? They're not, right? So this one is uh, um, our server. This one is two bit or. So uh, we have a 32-bit version of this. Oops. So let's say if it's a 32-bit version, the 2-bit version, this should not be congruent. Okay. Anyway, we can move forward here. So the next step is because of this, we're putting some data to that memory location, we're writing something to that memory location. So when we write something to the memory location, we're also bringing it to the cache, okay? So then 
we will use this function to flush those the data from those memory locations out of the out of the cache. And here we have a mm -er flush function. And this function eventually is the safe flush instruction. Uh, that's an instruction provided uh, in the Intel architecture to flush data from a particular address out of the cache. Yeah. So this eventually will do that. So you don't need to write a symbol of that. After that, we know that all of those 10 addresses, they're not in cache. The data from those 10 addresses are not in cache. Now, we try to access some of the cache items. Okay, that's the second one or the eighth one. Eighth one. Okay, we try to access that. So what will happen after this? So those two will go into the cache, but not the other eight, right? Then we do a measurement. So in here, we just try to, the measurement is it, very simple. We have a memory load. We are loading from that address to a local variable junk, right? So exactly the same as what we did in the assembly before, just a load, the memory load. And before the memory load, we measure the time. After the measure, after the memory load, we measure the time. Okay, that's it. Then we get a whole, how long it takes to do that. So a lot of randomness here. But let's say if we do, we run this program. This is the first time we run this program. Running more times. I think the number may be a little bit different. Just, okay. The number I put in the slides is two and eight. Um, that's, okay, first of all, you can you actually can see the difference. The third one is very fast, 90. The seventh one is very fast, 24. Everything else is like five times, six times bigger or even more. But this is not consistent with our slides, right? Our slides says two and eight. Here we, we have nine and two. Or so what we can do is we can disassemble this program. So I, I think I changed this in the code. Let's say. We are looking for this part which is after, which is in the main function, then after the CL flush. So here is the CL flush, as you can see. That function call, underscore mm underscore say flush, eventually becomes this instruction, CL flush. So that's an instruction provided by Intel. Not every architecture provides uh, this interface. Anyway, so after that, we are, um, where is the code we are to the, to this one? So this is the measurement part. So it's before the measurement. Somewhere here. Oh yeah. This one and this one, right? So here we are moving data here, moving data here. Um the three thousand seven thousand. What what is three thousand seven thousand? Oh yeah, that's it. So uh, 3,000 here actually means uh, in the code, I put a three there. 7,000 means in the code, I put a three, seven there. Okay. So it's 
that's why it's not consistent with uh on my sites uh, because this is something I want you guys to try. So I change the numbers. We can say when we change to three and seven, and we can say because they were they were accessed because they were accessed by those two statements. Then later, when we access them again, they are already in the cache. So when we access them again, it takes um, just a little bit of time for us to get the data. But for others, it takes much longer. Okay. okay. So this is a 32 bit. If we look at the 64 bit, similar results. So this one is quite obvious. Those two are much faster. Uh, this one is not necessarily, but you see a lot of randomness, right? So how do we handle randomness? When we have this kind of randomness, what do we do? Make multiple attempts. Exactly. We run many times, then we get the average, we use statistic methods, right? Yeah. That's why, so, as you can see, in cache side channel attack, we are kind of attacking a black box. Okay. We have some information how it works, but we definitely do not have a white box here. We don't know exactly how it works. A lot of guessing here, uh, a lot of uh, heuristics. Uh, that's why for many of the things we need to try many times, even to evict some data from the cache, so here we have a this architecture, we have a specific instruction, the say air flush to do that. In other architectures, we don't have such instructions. Then we need to try to evict everything in a set. Then we need to um, access the congruent addresses for thousands of times to guarantee oh, okay, we actually evict everything there. So we have I've been seeing code doing that. So here, yeah. So this is very distinguishable. In this, those two cases, actually. Yeah. Very good question. In a virtual machine, uh, you better compare with this one, architecture native. <laughs> yeah. So, um, in short, yes, because most of virtual virtual machines they they want to run programs very fast too. To run programs very fast, they have to run it natively, which means the instructions are directly running on the CPU. Even though, from the user's point of view, the instructions is inside of the virtual machine, but they are directly running on the C CPU. There is no another layer of translation. Um, there are some other approaches. I don't know if you guys heard of a, a memory bug detection tool, a dynamics analysis tool called Valgrind, which is a very powerful tool. So Valgrind is something we call a um, dynamic program analysis tool. So in Valgrind, you give it a, a binary, a L file, a Windows file, a binary. Then Valgrind will execute that binary and find the box of that. But Valgrind is very complicated. Uh, do you hear something like uh, something else, like AFL? American Body Pop. American what? Body Law. Yes, yes. American Body Law, whatever. So this is one of the uh, very successful farming tools. They work in different ways. So Valgrind, Valgrind will load the binary to memory. The binary will go to memory. The Valgrind will lift that binary to a intermediate language and the instrument on top of that intermediate language, then recompile it to binary again. Okay. This is, you have your original binary, this is lift to an IR, 
into media language, then instrument it by adding other things, and recompile this into another piece of binary. And this piece of binary is what is actually executed. The original one was never executed. Okay, that's for volume. Uh, AFL is a little bit different. AFL where compile the program, uh, there is a GCC version or LLVM version. The GCC version, you will just compile the program to assembly code dot S. Then we're instrument on top of instrument list dot S code, then compile that into binary and they execute that piece of binary. Okay. So, so Valgrind is very complicated because all of this happens at runtime. You lift that, you recompile that, you instrument that. That's why Valgrind is very slow. It's like 20 times, 100 times slower than the original program. Yeah. For every instruction you are executing, you need to do that. So very slow. Yeah. Uh, virtual machine mostly just executes those directly. Yeah. So even something like JavaScript, eventually they compiled into some instructions and directly executes on the CPU. So very fast. Yeah. Sometimes you think about it, you think there are so many layers in between, but they are directly executing on the CPU. So uh, this is a screenshot of uh, the LS CPU command. Uh, so one of the homework for today, not, not today, the homework is not for today, but for today's class, is to do an LS CPU on your own laptop and find out what kind of a cache setup it has. You may need to go to some website because LS CPU will not tell you how many ways it has, but some website will tell you how many ways are here, um, how many levels of cache here. But for example, this CPU, this is an i7 CPU, and uh, the L1 cache, there is data L1 cache and also instruction data uh, L1 cache. And it's 48K and 32K. L2 cache, 512K. L3 cache, M megabytes. They're very small, right? But this is inside of the CPU. OK, so how much time do we have? Do I still have half hour? OK. OK, the next. Uh, let's talk about the meltdown and the spectrum attack, which were discovered like, oh, has been seven years, seven, eight years ago, discovered. Uh, they discovered vulnerabilities in the CPU, which has been there for maybe 20 years. But uh, I, I would not say no one knows. Maybe people in Intel who designed this, they know this is possible. <laughs> but for the rest of the world, not really. Um, so Meltdown can allow attackers to read arbitrary physical memory from an unprivileged user process. Okay. If you know a physical address, you know what that address is? Even if that's a kernel address, from any user land program, you will be able to read that address. So this breaks what has been there for 30, 40 years, which is a privilege separation by the CPU. The Intel CPU runs at four levels, from ring zero to ring three, okay? Ring, but the modern software only using ring zero and ring three. We're not really using ring one and ring two. But Intel CPU actually um, provides that feature. You know I use that. Uh, and uh, what? Intel or other CPUs, uh, they are contract to the OS developers or application developers is if your program runs in ring three, it will not access ring one memory, right? That's their contract, that's their promise. Um, then we find out um, by using Meltdown, we can actually break that. There is a breach. So Meltdown uh, utilizes uh, out of order instruction execution feature on the modern CPUs. That's another architectural level optimization. 
So you write C code. You know you you think you know what the C code is executing, uh, but actually the compiler will do a lot of tricks to make the code run much faster. Then the CPU will do a lot of tricks at the micro architecture level to make those programs also run much faster. So what you are actually getting, the semantically is somehow already different from your C code. Of course, this applies to any other language, JavaScript or whatever. Uh, so let's see how it works. So first of all, so what is this out of order uh, execution? So from the CPU's level, the CPU have different units. There is a unit called the fetch to fetch an instruction from the memory. There is a unit called decoding after you fetch your instruction, CPU will decode what that instruction is. Then there is many, several execution unit to actually run that instruction. After that is, after that is execution is done, we need to write the results back to the registers so we have the other units as well. Okay. And obviously the CPU has different numbers of units for different purposes. We may have multiple execution units. And each box here represents one cycle. Okay, let's see. Yeah. How many bytes does the CPU fetch? I think usually it fetch 64 bytes. Yeah. So the cache size, yeah. Only one well, some instructions takes more than one cycle. Depends. This example. This integer addition may only need one cycle of that execution unit. It will also need one cycle of fetch, one cycle of decode. But the execution unit may be just one cycle. A more complicated instruction like integer multiply may require that execution unit for four cycles. Okay. Then a, a flow pointer, multiplication may even have need eight cycles. Yeah, they do not necessarily execute in one cycle. Especially for Intel, because they are complex instruction sets. Uh, we have instructions that are super simple. We have instructions to do something very, very complicated. Uh, for risk architectures, things are simpler because uh, they, they try to avoid having those very complicated instructions. Instead, they want to break those complicated instructions into smaller instructions, uh, then they will be not that, not that big. Okay, so here we have one example. Um, this is not any particular architecture instruction, but in general, let's say we have, the first instruction is to compute the multiplication of R1 and R2 to registers, move the data into R3. The second instruction will do R1 times R3, then move the data to R3. Uh, and, and R1 and 3, then move to R3. So you can see for those two instructions, the order of them is very important, right? You have to execute the first one, then execute the second one, because the second one relies on the result of the first one. Okay. That's very clear. So when you write your program, you write them in a sequential manner, statement after statement. Right? But sometimes you have the feeling that some of the statements, I can move them. Right? That doesn't really matter. I move the order of them. My program, the semantics doesn't really change. The same thing at the assembly level. Now here, then we have R7, and to R6, move to R1, then R8 to R6, to R5, R5, R3, R7. So look at those three instructions. Those two instructions, actually they're kind of independent, right? You can swap the order of them, should not matter. This one and this one may be different because um, you cannot swap those two, but, right, because 
if you swap those two, R7 will have a different value. But some of them you can you can swap them. No. Um because of this. R3, here we rely on R3 actually. Also, this instruction depends on this instruction because we use R3 and R3 is here. Uh, which means at least this instruction, this instruction, this instruction, those two instructions, they have to be executed in the same order. Okay. But the, those two, they don't have to execute in the same order. So if those two instructions takes very long time to execute, let's say this one takes a long time to execute, this one has to wait. This one, this one also has to wait. But those two, technically, they don't have to wait. Why do they wait, right? We can execute them earlier if we have enough resources. Right? The, the, the idea of out of order execution is exactly uh, for that. It dynamically schedule instructions and decide um, some of the instructions will be executed earlier than it shows up in the sequence of the code. Yeah. The reason we do that is they are not depending on the previous instructions and the CPU has more resource to use at this moment. The CPU has more resources to use. Why don't we just use them to execute future instructions as long as it's not depending on other instructions? And the, when we do that, when we do that, let's say we have enough resources to execute this one, this one, and this one at the same time, right? Then those two instructions are actually executed before the second instruction. So that's why it is called out of order. It's not in the order anymore. Yeah. Uh, all kinds of CPUs, yeah. So in the last 20 years, maybe even longer, there are a lot of crazy optimizations at that layer. Yeah. Single core also has those kind of optimizations. Yeah. That's what we hope. When you write a program, that's what you hope. But a CPU, so if you are Intel, you want to squeeze uh, all the potential of your CPU so you can beat NVIDIA or AMD. <laughs> AMD is trying to do the same thing, right? Okay, let's say those instructions, for example. Um, here we, so this is a figure we usually use in computer architecture course. Uh, in this one, we actually have uh, uh, each unit, we only have one. We have one fetch, one decode, one execution. I don't remember what it's R, right? It's right back. Uh, so each column, the, the x axis is time. You can consider that as each CPU cycle because we only have one resources then for each unit. Then at each time point, you should only have one of those box, right? If you have two, it doesn't work. Let's say the first instruction is multiply those, and this instruction will take, will, will use four execution cycles. Then the second instruction, after fetch and decode, it has to wait here. Because there is no, not only it has to wait here, it's also depending on the result of the previous one. Okay. Not because there's no resource, but also depending on one. the third one, depending on this one now. Oh, the third one actually also, oh, the third one also kind of not really dependent, but you cannot swap them because we're using R1. Right? So, anyway, if we strictly follow this order in a very classical way, how many CPU cycles those five instructions will take? It's kind of like 18 or 20 cycles, right? That will cost. Uh, but with some kind of out of order execution, uh, we, let's say here, this is still the first instruction. 
second instruction has to wait for the first instruction to finish. So it wait. However, the third instruction, the third instruction doesn't really have to wait for the first instruction. Okay, that kind of that kind of moment. Uh, of course, before we cannot really write R one before this one is done. But anyway, uh, let's say the, the example here shows that this here we have multiple execution unit. Now we can execute the third one before we execute the second one. See, the second one is still not executing. It's executing later. So by doing this, we can reduce this to like maybe we save the four CPU cycles. For 18 cycles, we save the four. That's 30% of performance boost um, without really changing the CPU, just changing the algorithm level and the CPU. That's why sometimes you say your, uh, the, another generation of CPU is Uh, not really different here. Store basically means you have to wait. Um, not not much different here. Yeah. Okay, so this is a complicated example here. Let's see what we have here. This is actually a kernel module. This piece of code is a kernel module. The kernel module has a global variable called a secret. Uh, seed map is a secret. It's in the kernel, not in user space. Um, because this is a kernel module, there is no main function. Okay, kernel module doesn't have a main function, but it still has its own entry function and exit function. So the entry function here is labeled as this one, the init. Uh, the test proc init, that's an entry function. So in this entry function, it will print out the secret address um, of this secret. It will print out the address. Yeah, that's it. So here we're not using print f, we're using print k because it's kernel function. There's no C library in the kernel. Uh, then we malloc, but it's a v malloc in the kernel. We malloc some uh, memory to the secret buffer. Then we create a data entry in the proc system, uh, fire system. Inux is a proc fire system. In that proc fire system, we create an entry called the secret data. And uh, then we just return. So, the only information we are leaking here is the address of that. It's a kernel address of that secret. We're not directly leaking the secret itself, right? Then there is a read function. So it will create a file under the proc file system. And it's a file, so you can open it, you can read it. Yeah. When you open it, you will actually, um, when you read it, when you read it, you will call the kernel function read block. block. Okay. So at a user land, you do a read that file. Under the hood, what happens is, this function will be called. And this function will copy that secret from that global variable to that buffer. So this buffer is at a kernel heap. Okay? This one is at global variable in kernel. We're copying from a kernel memory to another kernel memory. Okay. We're not we're still not leaking this to the user space. We didn't really leak this to user space. Uh, however, by using cache side channel attack, we will be able to, um, let's see, I have, so, based on 
the knowledge you just acquired? How can we? How can we get the secret from the user space? We know that address. You cannot directly read from that address. It will get a. It will give you a segmentation fault. There is. The address means it's a virtual address. That's a virtual address. It's kernel address, right? That's a kernel virtual address. So, uh, we can have that. You can't. You you don't have permission to do that. You cannot do that. Actually, it's already mapped in your address space, so you cannot. You don't need to ever map, but you don't have permission. It is. It is actually mapped. Let's say, uh, let's assume this is 32 bit to make this easier. 32 bit, the higher 1 GB is reserved for kernel, actually. If you go back to our previous slides, you will see that the higher 1 GB is reserved for kernel. So, does our slides have that part? I think we have, right? Yeah. The, this, this under is reserved for user space. Okay. You have the secret address, okay? It's somewhere here. You know that address. But if you directly access that, let's say you have a, a move that address, that address to your register or whatever, something like this, you will get a segmentation fault because the permission, memory permission of this part will not allow your code to read or write or do whatever, okay? Even though it's mapped there, you cannot do anything. So this will not work. So first of all, we cannot directly read from the cache. There's no instructions to do that. So what you are thinking is promising. We are going to use cache. Yes. Yeah, we need to use cache. Yeah. But we are going to use something more than cache, actually, in this case. We need to, we need to combine cache and the out of order execution here. Go ahead. Well, you don't have the permission to do that. If you or if you can already write a kernel modules and you can do whatever. Right. So here the goal is you only have you. User land permission. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think this is a full answer, but it's I'm wondering if this is a part of that mm -hmm. that if I am trying to do something that is getting held up, waiting for some instruction, mm -hmm. operating on the kernel to happen. Mm -hmm. And I, from that, try to figure out what would likely be holding me up. Uh, combining what and you guys said, that's what we want. We want to utilize out of order execution and the cache. Yeah. So we want to, so at the user space, we will try to access that. But when we access that, we should get a segmentation fault, right? But even if we are getting a segmentation fault, it may bring the data to the cache. It will not bring, let's say, when we do this, our goal is to bring that secret from the memory to register that we can access. But under the hood, what happens is the data will first go to hash, then go to register. Yeah. Okay. What the CPU do is it will check if you have the permission to access this, right? So the correct order is check if you have the permission to do this, then bring that to the cache then bring that to register. 
uh, because of those all kinds of optimizations, they will do them at the same time. It will bring it to cache first, do not necessarily bring to register. Then they are at the same time, they're checking if you have the permission to do so. And if bringing that to the cache is faster than uh, the security check, then you will successfully bring the data to the cache. Mm. Okay. As long as the data is brought to the cache, then you try to use set cache side channel attack we used before to infer what is in the cache. Yes. Then there's a very good chance we can uh, break this. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. If most of the guys and we are doing a, let's say the checks come out like we are not. Yeah. So what happens with cache data? The cache data is not removed. That's a mistake they are making, or maybe they feel that's a step that's not necessary to do, right? Because whatever you want to do at this level will be very uh, costly, and they don't want to do that. And because of that, that information leaving the cache, then you can use that cache, site cache channel to infer that. Yeah. In, in this case, um, a little bit, could be a little bit. For example, um, if you strictly follow that order, then you are not supposed to bring the data to the cache before you finish the security check. Yeah. So um, there are more details about this one, but uh, we, we can check that next week. But we only have like seven minutes. Yeah. So uh, next week, we'll talk about details of that one. And uh, you guys can try this on your computer, but it may not work anymore. This may have been patched. Uh, it was discovered 2000, no, 2016, 2017. Um, and uh, Meltdown is quickly patched. Spectrum is harder to patch. Then we will talk about Spectrum next week as well. Now the patch, the data gets out of the patch. Do you think it's patched, now the data gets out of the patch? No. First of all, there are many ways to patch this, not necessarily just at the hardware level. Also at the kernel level, yeah, um, yeah. There, there, there are several, there are several kernel features now to patch this. I don't remember the name. Uh, so whenever you want to patch something like this, you patch at multiple layers. Right? Yeah. So spectral is um, is still very very useful. Uh, uh, we will look at a spectral as well. Uh, next week we will see more examples. Uh, then uh, after that, I think um, next class, we're going to watch a video together. I think that video somehow summarize what we're doing so far in this class and also give us ideas where this is going. How do we really secure this? Um, it's a keynote speech from CCS multiple years ago. Right, cool. Questions? The last our email guys, maybe I will do it Monday night or Tuesday night. Yeah, maybe Monday night because Wednesday, Wednesday when is the activity? Thursday, Thursday is the activity. But uh, Wednesday, I guess a lot of people will, will be traveling Tuesday or Wednesday. So maybe we can do it Monday night instead. Then that will be our last class. Uh, then I will be available after that for any kind of uh, office hours you want, but it can only be online. Um, especially for you, you may have many questions for the final final CTF. Yeah. It will be the same four challenges, yeah, because the time is the same. So four challenges, and it will it will cover everything we discussed after after midterm. Yeah, um, I. I'm thinking maybe I will also add one from buffer overflow, whatever. I haven't decided yet. Do you guys want another buffer overflow or you just want to do Rob? <laughs> Rob takes time, but uh, because it takes time, I will put that in consideration, make it easier. <laughs> make sure it's doable. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, but uh, there are four challenges. I will not make all four of them very difficult. I expect uh, everyone to solve at least two or three. Then not everyone solved the last one, something like that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. I guess I see you guys next year, actually. <laughs> I mean, in person. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you. Trying to honor people to be taking this class next semester. Thank you very much.